Before we begin today's session, please know that all of us at NYU hope you and your family are safe and well in these unprecedented times. We are so thankful you have chosen to spend some of your time with us to continue learning from the collective knowledge of our NYU community. The NYU Alumni Association represents nearly 600,000 alumni all over the world. On average, we host nearly 700 events annually to connect you with your alumni community and with NYU. As part of our move to online programming, we are pleased to bring you today's session, Changing Social Norms Through the Arts During COVID-19. Today's session features Professor Carlos Gerinos from the School of Global Public Health and Steinhardt School in conversation with Alexandra Ariaga, very recent School of Public Health graduate. Congrats, Alexandra. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and host of IMGPH, the School of Global Public Health's podcast. If you have questions during the session, please enter them into the Q&A box on your screen. We will get to as many questions as we can at the conclusion of the program, time permitting. Thank you all for joining us. Alexandra, I'll pass the lead over to you. Thank you, Amanda, for the great intro. It is my pleasure to be here with you today. I would like to start off by asking Dr. Carlos Chirinos to introduce himself and tell us a little bit about his background, please. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here today speaking to you, although it would be great to see you, uh, but I can't. Um, so I am a professor in, uh, first at Steinhardt. I'm in the, my, my um, uh, regular position is at, at a school for, um, at Steinhardt in the music department at Steinhardt, where I teach in the music business program. And also I am an associated faculty in the School of Global Public Health. And you may, might be wondering how is that combination possible? So first of all, I am an anthropologist as a, uh, from my bachelor's degree uh, with an interest in ethnomusicology, but if, uh, probably at, at the heart, I am a musician. I started as a musician at a very, very early age uh, playing instruments, so I play clarinet and saxophone, and I had many bands. Uh, but I also had an academic career, and my academic career kind of took a combination of both music and and my interest in anthropology. Um, I completed a, a master's degree in ethnomusicology and a PhD in development studies. And essentially, through my research, what I am trying to or my my curiosity more than than the research, I think, is about how music um, uh, shapes uh, behaviors around health, uh, our lifestyles, how music songs, how, how narratives embedded in songs shape narratives. And, and I started looking at that from a, a non-scientific kind of point of view, more of a practic practitioner. But increasingly, I became interested in its, in its uh, effect effectiveness. And, and that took me through a combination of career pathways where, where I was based for 10 years at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London in the UK. And I kind of began a, a, a pathway of work combining research and practice. And my pathway kind of led me to work primarily in Africa in development projects. So often projects that require community engagement, that require people to be part of the development project. Uh, uh, and mainly most of those uh, research projects and, 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 and that I started kind of becoming first a consultant, then a researcher, an investigator properly, uh, led me to, to this big question of does music have a role in shaping behaviors and as we will discuss during this conversation, uh, we're, gonna know, we're gonna see that the role of behavior change in addressing a pandemic is crucial. Um, so I started investigating that and, and my career took me to several countries across Africa uh, and a particular project that I did during the Ebola epidemic of 2014-15 in, uh, in West Africa. Uh, and now I teach and research both in the in the school of uh, in, at Steinhardt and the school of public health, and also run the music and social change lab, which is basically a a, a, a center that enables me to work with the students from across NYU to try to investigate and explore these questions. 
Thank you so much for the great background story. So my first question to you is, what do you think is the role of music in a pandemic? So that's a, that's a great question to begin with because um, it's, it, it sounds already like it doesn't fit, it doesn't suit. Um, but the, the way music fits in many ways during an, a pandemic or during an epidemic outbreak, um, mainly because of its connections with popular culture. Um, so probably it's worth mentioning that uh, out of all the media uh, outlets out there, particularly digital media, uh, the most popular vi uh, videos, for example, on YouTube, the top five most popular videos on YouTube are music artists. So music has an appeal with the public and particularly with young people that no other format has, right? And on top of that, there is this very profound connection that, that, that fans have with artists. Uh, I don't know how many of you are listening in and have, you know, you would probably think immediately if I ask you, who's your favorite artist? You have that, that individual in your head already. You know their songs, you know their life, you know uh, who they go out with. And, and this has several degrees, right? So there are people that are maybe not so engaged, but there are people that are really highly engaged. And those that are highly engaged tend to pay attention to what an artist says. Uh, on the other hand, um, during a pandemic, you have a problem of, of information. And that's kind of like where the music fits in. The, the information and communication becomes a problem because there is a natural lack of trust in institutions. There is a natural lack of trust in, in uh, actors that suddenly appear during a pandemic. And often what happens is that the messages, the communication about the pandemic becomes very, very tang entangled, right? Confusing. Uh, some institution says a message, my WhatsApp says another message, uh, the TV says another message, the Twitter says another message, and this creates an, a, a huge amount of confusion. So what music does and what artists are able to do is through song, artists are able to compact very uh, uh, neatly information that can be very helpful and, and often, and this is the trick, this is the reason why it's understood, it's understood more than other formats, is because it connects with a particular cultural background of the listener, right? It's a, a singer or a composer, a songwriter usually writes their songs using colloquial language. They don't use um, uh, scientific jargon. And scientific jargon is necessary, but not the, the general public doesn't have all this, the tools to understand scientific jargon, right? So when the scientists communicate, they are trying to uh, primarily influence policymakers. But when scientists communicate to the general public, there is this challenge of how do we translate this very complex scientific knowledge or information into practical, easy to digest content. So the songwriters have that capacity. And, and another, another area that has been increasingly becoming clear in, the, in, in communication studies is the impact of, of narrative messaging as opposed to plain messaging. And, and the, the story goes basically, we are wired, our brains are wired to tap on to storytelling, stories, as opposed to single worded messages, right? Look, wash your hands. Uh, okay, humans don't respond to that in, in, in an immediate way. The humans require context. Why, why do I need to wash my hands? What do, I, what do I need to comply with all this uh, social distancing? So again, the, uh, the storytelling aspect of a song is able to articulate all of this in a, in a, in a very short amount of time, which is uh, the length of a song is about three, four minutes. And another thing that music has, and this is basically the, 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 the richness that a song has, is that it's accompanied by melody and harmony and rhythm. 
And for some reason, we are, again, wired to, to get satisfaction from the repetition of that. We can listen to a song a hundred times and we will not, there is no problem with that. We can hear it three times a day, five times a day, 10 times a day, and, we, I mean, and every time it makes us happy. That doesn't happen with a book. You, you read a book and maybe you read it a second time, <laughs> but you don't read it again three, four, five times. That doesn't happen. So right. again, it, it, it makes that, um, the song makes the message more uh, digestible. It's easier to repeat and therefore the repetition uh, has an impact on recall and retention, so memory. So it's, it's easier to capture the, the key message and, and retain that message if it comes in a song format. So that in a nutshell, more or less, and there is obviously other areas like fundraising and how celebrities, music celebrities have an impact on that as well. But I'm sure we will we'll get to talk about that. Yeah, actually. So with that comment in mind, I was wondering, what is the perceived impact of music and what's the role that artists and celebrities play? So the perceived role of, 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 of the impact of songs, and this, we have to be careful, obviously, about the language, right? Is uh, behavior change. And I think this is the critical kind of theoretical uh, uh, framework that we need to, to first unpack, right? Mm -hmm. Which is that during a pandemic, just following up from your previous question, you have a sudden need for behavior change that is rapid, that is quick, and that is dramatic in the sense that, like we all have experienced, we went from being outside one day to being not able to go outside the following day. And these dramatic changes demand, and, and, and add to that the hygiene and sanitation. I'm sure everybody that is listening is going crazy every time they go out, coming back with the, with the shopping and hand sanitizing and wash your hands and you, you have to wash them for 20 seconds. But how do you wash your hands? And, and is it between the fingers? Is it here? So this is small, this, all of these uh, changes of behavior that the, that the, uh, the response uh, requires um, are difficult to articulate and to, and to, and, and to get people to comply. Um, so what a song can do is help with a small nudges and not only the song because that's, that's the other point. It's not just the song. The song is, is one component of this macro intervention that an artist is able to do. So the song has packed information, but the artists, based on their, on their own um, initiative, they tend to give a lot of messaging out, particularly through social media. They also speak to the media, to the uh, traditional media, but they have a narrative that they put out. And often this narrative matches their song. And often these songs and these narratives matches the need for behavior change. Um, so what artists are able to do is, uh, is a combination of, of several things. But one is pack information in a song and make it repeatable. Second, through the, this uh, connection that uh, artists have with um, their fans, which is very, is, is based, I mean, if the way we look at it in, 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 a, in the theory is through social learning theory. Right, which is that essential identification between an individual and another one, that when uh, that person, and this is the role model basically, uh, changes their behavior, makes the, 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 the person that identifies with that individual also change their behavior. And this is, is very important, particularly with young people and how young people look up to artists often they will look up and, and follow the lead of an artist and not the lead of several other authoritative members of their, in, of their surroundings, right? Parents, teachers, uh, right? Um, uh, older people. So when you have the engagement of artists through a kind of a, an, an immediate impact of, the, of engaging an artist is that you are engaging their fans. 
And that's something that, uh, in particular in health promotion and health education, is very difficult to attain, right? Attain, uh, grab the attention of young people to learn about health. That's very difficult. Uh, whereas an artist is able to articulate it in a different way, using a different narrative form, uh, which tends to um, um, move and go well with young people. Absolutely. So something that is really interesting to me, I would like for us to talk a little bit more about the specific artists that are engaging in this. So I know that we have Ruben Blades, we've seen Bad Bunny, uh, we've seen people in Vietnam doing little TikTok dances that went viral. So we've seen it all over the world. But if you could tell something to the artists that are deciding to delve into the public health scenario with their songs, what would you tell them about that responsibility? Well, I think most artists are, are recognizing that. Uh, the, and that's, for example, the reason why I started the Music and Social Change Lab. I noticed uh, few, some years ago, and this goes back to, again, my previous research during the Ebola epidemic with, with music, uh, that we can come, go back to if we need to. Um, I started noticing that the, the uh, music artists um, and the, these narratives around social change were becoming closer and closer and closer. And this is not a process that started five years ago. If we think about the, the social movements related to music, uh, it, it really goes back to the 1960s, 70s, right? The idea of first the connection, the human connection, the um, uh, empathy, for others that the hippie movement in the 1960s, 70s music kind of brought. Then in the 1980s, there was a phenomenon, which was the whole idea of fundraising for causes. And there was the famine in Ethiopia and the famous Live Aid concert, which is now very, very, very well known because of the, uh, the, um, the replica that they did for the film Bohemian Rhapsody, right? When Queen and Freddie Mercury sing. Uh, performs for 20 minutes. Uh, but those events, uh, Band Aid, Live Aid, and more recently uh, Global Citizen Festival and other festivals basically have, have shaped this norm that artists are in some way connected to, um, to the issue of, to the idea of social change. Uh, so I think for artists to really be able to communicate about health, first they need to uh, educate themselves. Uh, you know, and really understanding the challenges and, and the complexities of, of uh, communicating about health. And that's not easy, but it's possible. And uh, second, collaborate, collaborate with other artists to, to be able to reach more, more diverse uh, uh, fan bases, basically. Yeah, that makes sense. And so at the beginning you mentioned the role that you had in the Ebola epidemic in Africa. So let's go back to that and can you tell us more about what happened there, your involvement, and what was the impact of radio on Ebola? Great, so this takes me back to my to personal stories, uh, you know. Uh, so right before the Ebola epidemic, uh, in the Ebola epidemic in West Africa started it at the end of 2013, so very similar to the current coronavirus uh, uh, epidemic started in December 2013. The coronavirus started December 2019. Uh, but so before 2014, which is when the epidemic really uh, started to to appear in the news and and uh, and and when it was declared a, an international um, health uh, uh, risk, um, my job was primarily working with. Uh, community radio stations in, in uh, all over Africa. Uh, I was a, a consultant for several health and, and development communication projects and most of my work was working with community radio stations to shape their programming around a specific behavior change that they required, right, that their projects required. So I worked in projects on HIV AIDS, for example, to increase um, testing uh, I worked on projects on, on um, um, infectious diseases and preventing infectious diseases coming from animals to humans, which very much connect with the current coronavirus crisis, the zoonotic origin of, of the diseases. Um, 
And um, part of what I was already understanding and really uh, becoming very clear to me from a practical uh, practice point of view was that radio had a very important role in shaping and in informing com communities in very rural and poor areas, right? Where illiteracy is very high. So 90% of people do not know how to read or write. Uh, they don't speak the official language of a country. So in most cases would be, in, in Africa would be English, French, Portuguese. And when you go to those uh, rural areas, they don't necessarily speak those languages. They speak local languages. So the community radios have that role. So everything came together in, uh, in mid-2014. I started uh, a kind of, a, again, out of a conversation with a good friend. Um, and, and this connects back to my, my, my dual life, both in academia and in, 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 the, in the music industry. Um, I was very much involved in all the uh, Latin and African music festivals in the UK and in Europe. So I knew all the agents, I knew all the programmers of, of African music, those that were actually paying for African artists to come to Europe and perform and for, for Latin artists. And I found that one of my best friends, uh, essentially all there, and this is what, like, what happens, uh, the stigma of Ebola in 2014 meant that many festivals started canceling African artists uh, coming to perform in Europe because uh, the, the festivals didn't want to take the risk. And these are coming from, from you know, like the, the Ebola epidemic was in, in Guinea and Liberia, but these people were coming from Tanzania and they didn't want. Um, um, but um, part of what I did then is I, I spoke to these to this agents and realized that, oh, this is happening, let's do something. And that something became a song, a song uh, that we created called Africa Stop Ebola. And it became as a, it, it really started as a collaboration with artists and I became a, a de facto um, consultant, project manager, that, uh, everything, because essentially I was the only one that was studying the, pro the problem. Right. I, I was already, because of my work and because of my research background, I was already kind of really tracking the problem from a behavioral point of view. So I realized that community engagement is a problem. The problem is more fear, mistrust, uh, distrust of health workers, distrust of the government, and lack of hope in the messaging. So we created a song that was all about building trust and building hope in the response. And I don't know how much how, how we are with time, but I could just show the video or just share it here in the in, in a panel or send it. Later. I think yeah, I think we have time to share the video. I would love that. Okay, so this the the song I'm going to show. I will show just uh, maybe the first thirty seconds, just so you can read in English the translation. The song was uh, features twelve artists from West Africa, very well known, including Mori Kante who is a Guinean artist who passed away today, in fact, uh, in, in Guinea, uh, sadly. And, um, and the song is, is performed in six languages. You will hear the beginning French, uh, because it was, it was really designed for Guinea, which is a Francophone country, uh, but it features the other five languages which are spoken in the region. As, as Susu, Kisi, uh, Lingala, Bambara, and these are these are more um, no indigenous languages per se, but uh, um, uh, vernacular languages are spoken in the region. Uh, so, I'll... right. So that's super catchy. Yeah. So the song <laughs> first. Um, so the song goes on for five minutes and it features that that actually that last artist that I, that I paused on was Mori Kante, uh, uh, rest in peace. Um, so we created the song and the song was not really meant to be, we, we found that at the, at the time there were many initiatives to try to raise funds, raise funds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we thought like, what is the point of doing a song to raise funds that is going to maybe raise a little bit of money towards, you know, it's like raising $2 to fight a, a, a $20 million uh, problem, right? So is it going to be impactful, the money? Mm, maybe not. 
So we focus more on the behavior change content. So the song has uh, uh, behavioral nudges, and this comes from behavioral economics that are very specifically aimed at trying to modify the behavior of the listener. Uh, it also uses a number of, of, of tools. Uh, so for example, it, it features 12 artists, uh, all of them from the region, all of them with a, with a track of social work in their countries. So they were already in a good position with the public, right? The public knew, for example, that first artist that we saw, the second artist, the reggae artist that we didn't see perform, Tik and Jaffa Koli, uh, has, a, has had for 20 years and, and uh, kind of an initiative where, whereby he goes to a, 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 a city and he plays a concert and the money raised from the concert is used to build the school. And then the, the, he uses the fans to help build the school. So literally the money is to pay for the, uh, for the, uh, the things to build the school. But then all the, uh, the work, the, the work is conduct is done by the fans. So that's a pretty kind of cool way to engage their audiences in social change, right? So they are not just improvising it, which is often what happens when pop artists become part of this uh, uh, narrative. So we can talk about that, right? Which is the idea that some people really learn, already see that, right? Like, like that happened with the, right at the beginning of the quarantine, some artists went and did Imagine, and all the criticism was about, oh, you, are, you can do, be doing Imagine in, this, in your super rich mansion while we're here, you know struggling basically yeah <laughs> uh, so that was so, so that already makes the project have appeal have a social appeal and then we used for example reggae reggae as a as a musical background and that was part of like a, a, a like we started thinking well this problem is now in guinea so shall we do it with guinean music yeah but what if it goes to senegal and what if it goes to Ghana? And what if it goes to Nigeria? So we have to do another song for every time. Every time. And no, so, and reggae is great. So. <laughs> and reggae, not only reggae is great, but reggae is considered a Pan-African music because it started out of Jamaica. So right. in, in, the, in the mind of African musicians, they see reggae and, the, and obviously the, the kind of the mythical role of Bob Marley Mm -hmm. as, a, as, as a, and it's also a type of music that always has spoken about social issues affecting uh, black people, essentially, against right. racism. So it's, it's essentially a music that is against racism and against the idea of, of, of uh, Babylon, which is basically the, the, the complex uh, um, um, capitalism, basically. That's what it yeah. is. So the song became a kind of a hit. We managed to do an agreement with the Universal Music in France. The song appeared in several commercials, fundraising for Medicine Sans Frontiers, the Doctors Without Borders, with whom we made a, a kind of a collaboration. And that collaboration took us to actually do a song contest in Guinea, where we had over 500 artists submitting their songs. We had we developed a community engagement strategy out of out of a song, and that's what the song really managed to kickstart the community engagement strategy that we then did with communities in Conakry in Guinea. Perfect. And then my last question for you is, based on everything you just told us about how music helped out in the Ebola epidemic in Africa. How do you think we can grab some of those lessons and apply them to the current COVID-19 pandemic? Well, something like, like a spontaneous phenomenon that has happened. And this kind of, for me, has been obviously the, 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 the size of this crisis is like no other uh, that we have experienced in our lifetime. Um, I mean, co coronavirus and the impact it has had on all our, on all our lives around the world. Uh, but something I noticed when I, when the, right when the epidemic started, which is one of my favorite subjects, by the way, is like I am, I am obsessed with epidemics and epidemiology. Part of what I do is cultural epidemiology, which is try to understand the cultural uh, complexities of, uh, of an epidemic, out, of, of an outbreak, basically, and how people perceive the outbreak. Um, but I started kind of looking at um, how many people were making songs about coronavirus. And I started the first three weeks 
and I counted over 50 and I lost track because there's so many, way too many. Um, yeah, that's more than I imagined. I had no idea. I, there are hundreds now, hundreds and hundreds, by com created and released by well-known artists and by artists you don't know, and you right. would not know. But the, <laughs> the, the thing about that is, uh, and this is what I'm studying more than what I think the artists are already harnessing that, and again connects with the idea of social change and how music and social change were really coming together and becoming and more than just a, a humanitarian type of component of this connection between music and social change, I also see it as a business strategy. It benefits the marketing of all the artists. It improves, it improves their, their image, their reputation. So what is happening now is, is a, this deluge of, of, of songs and, and performances about coronavirus. Some of them have been amazing, amazing and perhaps, and this is the thing, we don't have evidence hard evidence in a controlled trial to determine this. But when you compare, for example, and I was going to show it, I don't know if we have 30 seconds to show one example from Vietnam and perhaps the most, uh, um, uh, the most clear example, Vietnam is a case in, in, in coronavirus outbreak that is very important to, under, to look at uh, because being very close to China, Vietnam has had one of the lowest numbers of uh, cases in the world. Um, even when they had direct flights to Wuhan, um, uh, daily flights. And part of it was the response, and part of it was the way in which they engaged young people in the, in the response, and part of what they used was a song and a, and a TikTok dance that is very popular. Yeah, I think that's the one I was telling you about. It's, I've seen it, so it's super popular. Um, go ahead and play it, and then we can get started with the Q&A <clears throat> Yeah, so the, so the Ministry of Health in... in um, in Vietnam, kind of, kind of commissioned this artist, this popular artist, to make a song. But what happened was the song, they released the song with a funny animation video, and the video was very popular. But then a dancer from Vietnam uh, in, in TikTok, TikTok, by the way, is the fastest growing social media uh, uh, outlet right now uh, uh, in terms of their, their their fan base, their user base, and also the amount of content is being published. It's becoming a very important uh, um, platform for music dissemination and music monetization, in fact, as well. So what this artist in Vietnam did, he's a dancer. And the dancer, he created a choreography about the song and using the way the song, the lyrics of the song as a choreography to show people how to wash hands and do things. So let me just show, it will be 30 seconds and it will be over to you. So, so cute. So it's pretty catchy and pretty cool. And what you see there, the, what is interesting is what you see there is, is a process that doctors, nurses, health workers take weeks to learn. The whole idea of this, 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 this. So the common people, us, that we are not, if we're not a nurse, if we're not a doctor, we, we were not supposed to learn that. That's not, that wasn't for us. So the song and the choreography does that, does a training and a, and a behavioral training that re, re, retention, again, you cannot retain all those steps, but the, the, um, the choreography and the song in your, in your head helps you do it. You just need to remember the song and you will, know, you will do the steps. So the song combination with the dance has that potential, that unique potential for health communication and promotion. And I believe it's actually the right amount of time that you're supposed to wash your hands for. So it's like if you Indeed. memorize the song, then you're like, oh, okay. The, the, the time it gets me to sing the song in my head is the amount of time I should be washing my hands. Indeed. Indeed. And also the steps. And yeah, also and for, steps. And for children. For yeah. kids, because those are the hardest to train. Because they, you know, if you are not over them, I have an 11 year old, I can tell you. I hope she doesn't listen to me. <laughs> um, but, uh, it, you know, if you're not over her, like, okay, yeah, and today I wash it like that, but tomorrow I just wash it like that. Yeah, yeah. But this, this is a this... fun way to, to engage the children and everything. Exactly. All right, so let's get started with our Q&A portion. For those of you who are watching and would like to submit any questions, feel free to do so now through the chat box. So the first question says, 
How do you think our practices of engaging with music will be habitually changed within the next few years post-corona? Specifically because we've been interacting with live music through live streaming services and aren't experiencing sounds within the same room. So I think it's more about the music, the music industry, right? I think. <laughs> well, no, it's a, it's a very interesting question. I think, you know, there, is a, there are a lot of fatalist views now on, on every single industry, right? Uh, but one that really is, is struggling is those industries that rely in, 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 in their income in large mass meetings, right? So sports, sports, obviously you have the, the broadcasting possibility, but the concerts and the way they generate income is dramatically challenged now. Um, I think that, you know, just comparing, and, I'm, and this I'm being hopeful, I'm not being, uh, I don't have the specific data to tell you this, but I believe that the, uh, this crisis will fade out. It will not take three months, it will not take six months, it will take probably a couple of years. But I am sure we will go back to normal at some point. The problem is how long can this industry survive until that return to normal, right? And the problem with that is the maintenance uh, of large, large spaces like, uh, like concert halls, stadiums that require a ton of money. And because if you don't bring people, you cannot have them, that income. So I think that most of the music industry will, um, reinvent itself it's at least the live music part of it there are so many things happening now with video games uh, i'm sure you probably uh, alexander you were you heard about the concert on what, what on what this um like on the online like the online games that are played yeah. live you mean yeah travis travis scott did a concert oh yeah on, yeah and uh, on i can't remember the name of the game but basically, they had 12 million people. Could million. it be Fortnite? I feel like Fortnite. that's the most popular. Yeah, some Fortnite. Okay. Fortnite. Yeah. Uh, where they had 12 million people attend. Wow. You cannot do that in a live. There is no venue that holds 12 million people. There is no that's... venue that holds a million people. Uh, so that's already giving you... A, obviously, it's not the same experience. I wouldn't pay... If, you wouldn't pay $100 like you would pay to go to Madison Square Garden. But right. you pay a million, you, know, you might pay a dollar or a two dollars thing. Yeah, two dollars, yeah, maybe. And That's if you already, can get 12 million people to, to pay, pay a dollar. Two, exactly, exactly. And without the costs associated with running a venue, which are huge, you know, from risk, uh, security, production, home, and obviously this, this doesn't go without its, its, its downsides. It's, a lot of people that works in those that have been working in these industries are also affected. <coughs> so it's not a solution. I don't think it's a solution, but mm -hmm. it's probably a temporary solution until we come out of these challenging times and then see what is the next stage. But I think yeah. the, the, I think that we will come back to that at some point in the future. Yeah, I agree. So for a second question we have, do you think there will be a high increase of how much art is being released into the public sphere during this time? If so, do you think that it will affect the, peop the way people interact with art? Mm, so <clears throat> I think that there is definitely a, a huge output of artistic work in, during this time of digital artistic work. I think something that this, uh, this uh, crisis is, is helping do is bring the artists out of the non-artists as well. Those that were not artists before and now say, well, um, you know, I always wanted to do drawing. I have a lot more time available now. Let me start drawing. So yeah, a lot of, I, I think we're gonna have a lot more art because of that. On the other hand, I think we have, a, we're gonna have a, a, a innovative approaches to traditional forms of art because most of it now has to fit in a little square like this screen right so it needs to fit there if it doesn't fit there i don't know um 
I think what the, the what what is a problem is the the lack of remuneration for artists, and this is affecting artists all over the world. I mean, in some places more than others. Um, but is the is the idea that um, art art is kind of free? It's always free, you know. It's on YouTube, it's free. On Facebook, it's free. On Instagram, it's free. Uh, the amount of options now to log on to a, a live music, a live concert uh, on Instagram on a Friday night are endless and they're all free. And there is a problem with that because I don't know how long we can continue to do that since artists, professional artists, depend entirely on their, on their work. Uh, so I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a larger, more complex problem related to the infrastructure to the way this, the internet works, to the way the, infra, the to the way the corporate world has taken over the platforms for artists, arts uh, distribution, and in which creators, artists, and creators in general are users essentially. So uh, they, uh, like most of these platforms, they really live off our content. Right, all social media platforms live off our content. TikTok wouldn't be any popular right now if it wasn't for all the content that we create. Um, obviously, you, so you have all these artists creating thirty-second uh, comedy comedy slots, um, and nobody's paying them. They are making it for because they want to do it. Obviously, there are those that develop their careers. It's definitely a platform. There are opportunities for for. Um, um, marketing and yes but but they still the i think what is um what this crisis will do to them to arts in general is to reiterate or reconfirm that arts is a free is free and that we all get it for free and there's obviously a problem with that with livelihoods being affected uh, many artists that only de depended on gigs <clears throat> paid gigs and now have no gig at all um, how do we do with them? And they are great musicians, so uh, they are great artists. We don't want to lose the arts, their 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 output. Absolutely. So I really want to squeeze in this last question in the few minutes we have left. The question reads: Going back to what you mentioned about teaching children to have good health habits, while there are teaching resources for kids now based in music, do you think we'll see more of that in the future? What about for adults? Well, you know, my, I don't think I was, I, I think it's very effective with uh, art, with arts based education is very effective with children. It's very effective with the elderly and more in, in, a, in a therapeutic form. I think with adults, you still have the influence. And, and I think with adults, it's, it's not so much the song itself, but the, that relationship they have with artists the affiliation they have with artists. Um, there is that already, and that is being actually proven, not proven, but there is evidence of that, that for example, <clears throat> those fans of artists that are, are highly committed to uh, causes, international development causes, right? Social, uh, uh, social causes like, like Bono, for example. Uh, those fans tend to be more, uh, tend to donate more for causes. So they tend to contribute more to charitable work, right? And that's what happened with, for example, with the uh, Live Aid in Britain in, in the 1980s and in, the, and in this country as well with uh, we, we Are the World, uh, which is that the songs and the, uh, and the involvement of the artists changed the giving culture. The giving, the culture of giving, basically made young people uh, be givers, which was something not traditional, not common. You know, in Britain of the 1980s, those that were donating to charity were pension pensioners, most of them, so over 65. And suddenly you had 20-year-olds giving 10 pounds a month or 10 dollars a month towards a cause. So I think the artists and the interaction between artists and fans work in different ways. For some, it's more the, the song itself, the, the uh, repetition of the messaging. For some others, it's more how the artist's uh, persona influences their lifestyle. 
and there are, for example, there are diseases that are the result of lifestyles, right? The way we eat, what we consume, uh, and that is shaped, and there is evidence of that, that is shaped by our, our uh, celebrities our, or, or the, our relationship we have with celebrities. We tend to copy those role models or we tend to see those role models as, as confirmation of, of, of something is positive. There is evidence, for example, that when, uh, whenever a celebrity uh, has a test for a disease, uh, demand for testing increases, which is the Magic Johnson example when he was tested for HIV AIDS. It basically, it was the single most effective information to get black men to get tested. It was Magic Johnson did it. Oh, wow, see if he did it, I can do it. Right, so that's the complex uh, connection that we have with celebrities. Uh, uh, which yeah shapes shapes our 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 behaviors and our our health seeking behaviors our lifestyles and all of this has an impact on how we shape our behaviors around health. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Chirinos, for all your answers and your time today. And thank you for everyone that is watching and joining us. Thank you very much, everybody. Yes, thank you so much to Dr. Torino and to Alexandra for this wonderful interview. I'm so happy that we had the opportunity today to share your conversation. And um, to you, Dr. Torino, your research and expertise in this field. I think it was really fascinating. And I think a lot of food for thought as all of us head into this holiday weekend. Now, to you attendees, if you're interested in further scholarly content, please check out our events calendar on the NYU alumni page under events and programs. Our five question series continues on May 27th at 7 p.m. China time with professors Barbara Edelstein and John Jun Zhang with NYU Shanghai in conversation about their Ineffable Garden exhibition at Alisan Fine Arts in Hong Kong. Thank you all again for joining us. We here at NYU wish all of you good health and safety. Have a great weekend.